Welcome to the webinar on Hong Kong Enhance the Value for Capturing New Opportunities in Asia, organized by the Hong Kong Trade Development Council. In today's webinar, we will hear from business leaders on their insights on how European companies could take advantage of Hong Kong's unique role to capture new business opportunities. During the webinar, you are welcome to raise questions in the Q&A box in the video frame. Selected questions will be asked in the Q&A session. Towards the end of the webinar, we welcome all our participants to join the live networking session on Rambo. Please stay till the end of the webinar for the details. Now, without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Patrick Lau, Deputy Executive Director of Hong Kong Trade Development Council to give his welcome remarks. Let's hear from Dr. Lau. Hans, uh, Victor, uh, Arno, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, virtually. Uh, on behalf of the Hong Kong Trade Development Council, let me uh, warmly welcome you to this webinar. This is uh, the largest online event we have uh, specifically jointly organized with our European uh, partners since the COVID-19 outbreak. It's now more than a year into the pandemic, uh, despite encouraging progress on the vaccination programs in many parts of the world, global business landscape remains fraught with uh, challenges. The way forward is to identify and capture new opportunities. Uh, today's webinar aims to share insights uh, on this. On economic growth, one of the obvious bright spots is uh, mainland China, which is the growth driver of the world. The Greater Bay Area is in turn the key growth driver for the mainland China. The Greater Bay Area offers a whole range of opportunities for overseas businesses in various sectors, including innovation and technology, sustainability, healthcare, creative industry, consumer products, and much more. Another promising market that we will talk about today is ASEAN, the Southeast Asia market, which has a population of 650 million, almost twice that of uh, the US, and uh, uh, with very positive uptrend in the economic growth. For international businesses, the most efficient way to tap into these markets in Asia is to work with Hong Kong, which is a, a two-way business and investment hub with close connections with ASEAN as well as uh, the mainland China. And Hong Kong is itself uh, a part of the GBA. I'm so pleased today that we have uh, assembled together uh, a panel of speakers, very well qualified. My colleague uh, Nick, Mr. Nicholas Guang, our director of research, will first give us a very insightful update on the Hong Kong economy and the GBA development. We also have two very prominent business leaders to share about uh, their knowledge of the business environment in Asia, as well as the region's potential. Mr. Victor Chu really needs uh, no further introduction. He is the chairman of the Hong Kong European Business Council, uh, as well as the chairman and CEO of First Eastern Investment Group, a Hong Kong-based investment firm with many pioneering investments in the mainland China, Southeast Asia, and other regions. Victor also co-founded uh, Pitch Aviation and sits on the board of uh, Airbus. The other expert speaker we have today is uh, Mr. Arnold Chen, Director for Hong Kong and Pearl River Delta at uh, Zhong Shua and Sons China Limited. The UK-based conglomerate Shua Group, renowned for its uh, diverse business in property, aviation, food, beverage, retail and shipping, is itself a perfect example of an international company that has, have, that has successfully expanded into Asia through Hong Kong. Finally, allow me to remind all participants today that we at the HKTDC is ever ready to help global businesses uh, tap into these business opportunities. It is part of our mission to support and promote Hong Kong's role as a link connecting international companies with opportunities in the GBA, 
mainland China and ASEAN. We do this through our world-class international conferences and trade fairs, as well as business missions and other services. I'm very pleased to share with uh, all that uh, just a few hours ago, in fact, in this uh, uh, building, we launched a one-stop platform called GoGBA, which helps all businesses, but specifically also including international companies to expand into the GBA through Hong Kong. The digital part of uh, GoGBA, which is a mini program, offers uh, essential market information covering regulatory and policy updates and subsidy schemes, as well as very useful business support tools. And I encourage all to, uh, to download this app to see uh, that it can be, be helpful to your business if you are to venture into the GBA. So before I end, I must thank all our 20 core organizers and uh, supporting organizations to make this webinar uh, uh, happen. And we look forward to continue cooperation with these partners. On that note, I wish everyone a very rewarding webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lau. Next, we are honored to have Mr. Hans Polis, Vice Chairman, Federation of Hong Kong Business Association Worldwide to deliver his opening remarks. Let's hear from Mr. Polis. Good afternoon, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, on behalf of the Hong Kong Associations Worldwide, I'd like to welcome you on this special webinar, Enhanced Value for Capturing New Opportunities in Asia. The Federation is representing 46 associations in 35 countries and regions in the world with approximately 11,000 members. In Europe, we present 18 country associations. And why these numbers? It says all about the strong business relationship between companies located all over the world and Hong Kong. So many companies are doing business with or via Hong Kong, from which a lot are connected with in Hong Kong associations in their country. And to make a short sidestep, may I invite you, if you are not a member yet, to join the association in your country. Hong Kong as a city with a high number of benefits and a gateway to mainland China. We all know that doing business in China makes Hong Kong relevant in many ways. It can make it more easy for international companies to do Hong Kong, to use Hong Kong as a place to be. The international business environment in Hong Kong, with a lot of available knowledge and consultants, as an international financial center, but also the one country, two systems in place, just to mention only a few advantages. I'm pretty sure today you will learn more from the speakers. From business perspective, the mentioned benefits and many more are important to work with Hong Kong. A strong base for doing business throughout Asia. The bridge to China with interesting opportunities like the Greater Bay Area. The Greater Bay Area shows a large scale of economies with opportunities for international business back and forth. For sure, the previous two and a half years were challenging for Hong Kong in several ways. One of them, the COVID-19, has impacted the whole world in many ways, and still it is. For sure, it puts the economies under pressure. We still have to deal with beating the COVID-19, but we see the first recoveries already. A never experienced situation as the pandemic by the current living generations. The big question will be, if you will face a new normal, what will be the impact on certain economies and for particular economies and industries? Will the future also bring new opportunities? Yes, I'm convinced it will, but you need to be creative, smart and seeking for these opportunities. Every crisis will provide new chances, knowing companies will disappear, but new enterprises will start. A lot of questions which will be answered this year and next year. Each economy must face reality, what is needed to gather growth again. The current momentum makes it very interesting for Hong Kong to reposition and show the advantages which she can bring a strong business com community. After a period of challenges for Hong Kong in several ways, combined with the impact of COVID-19, Hong Kong has to take the opportunity to share information about the services which can be offered. It's important for companies to learn and understand. 
I'm still a very strong believer of globalization and not a favorite of protectionism. Protectionism will not benefit economies and growth, but is only short-term thinking. Europe is very much interested in using Hong Kong, especially as the bridge for seeking opportunities in China. But we need to understand the position of Hong Kong, the possibilities offered and advantages. European companies are looking for opportunities to do imports and exports. Information about Hong Kong's capabilities will be key for a better understanding and get the trust needed to do business. Although it's probably not new in perception of the listeners, I like to emphasize that things are changed and therefore it's important that information will be shared about Hong Kong's possibilities. We all need to understand in a better way the added value of doing business between European enterprises and Hong Kong. And therefore, I'm very happy with the speakers of today who will be in a position to inform all participants watching and listening to this special webinar. I'd like to wish you a great and informative webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Paulus. Next, may I invite Mr. Nicholas Guan, Director of Research, HKTDC, to share on the updates on Hong Kong economic landscape and Greater Bay Area development. Mr. Guan, please. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, as well as maybe good evening, good evening for our friends around the world. I understand there may be someone who are joining us for, even from America. Um, what I try to do is something very easy. I leave the tough part to my two other uh, colleagues and speakers. Uh, what I try to do is to lay the groundwork for updating you of what the Hong Kong economy is like as well as what the Greater Bay Area, the key features uh, are. But before we talk about that, we have to look at the, raw, uh, look at the world. Uh, the COVID-19 has been uh, more than a global event. Uh, it will be very historical anyway. But a few data actually helps to understand how divided we are as well as how closely related we are, which I think is critical for us to understand why Hong Kong as well as the GBA here. From the data, you can see that um, a lot of countries are actually suffering uh, quite severely from uh, the pandemic. But East Asia seems to stand out in two ways. One is that it's relatively less infected, even though this is the place which start the whole pandemic. Um, in, on average, in particular in Hong Kong, you can see that our infection rate, which means the confirmed cases per population or per million of population, is one of the lowest and is uh, actually less than one tenth of the global average. Uh, our death rate, uh, those who are infected versus those who uh, pass away, is actually not that particularly low. Uh, in fact, we are slightly lower than the uh, global average which means that our medical treatment for those who are being affected may not be particularly strong or uh, outstanding, but we have been able to um, help a large part of our population not infected. Um, but that is not something we want to highlight. What I highlight is that uh, the good result we see in East Asia is partly to do how we see the world actually. We understand a pandemic is a global situation. No one can get away from it by themselves, even though we have been trying to isolate ourselves from the others. But to handle that, we need to work closer, to we, uh, closer with each other. If you look at the world economy, the two trends of globalization and deglobalization, you can clearly see that East Asia is still the major force for globalizations. And that's why I would like to highlight and why Hong Kong remains important. If you see from this uh, basic economic chart, uh, the general theme is basically we uh, managed to rebound from one of the worst crises we ever experienced in the last 20, 30 years. Uh, GDP has been turned positive in the first quarter. Our export turned so strong in 30% growth in the first uh, uh, quarter of this year. But there are only one thing which we, are, we are probably will still suffer quite a while is our tourist uh, arrival. Um, we're still 99% down from the previous level. Uh, that has to do with how we deal with the pandemic 
and how we deal with re-globalization, how we put the world back together in a normal situation. And behind that, I think the key theme here is that we cannot just look at ourselves, even we manage to have our domestic economy recovering, ultimately we have to go beyond the border. And next to us is the great, uh, Greater Bay Area. In fact, for most friends outside Hong Kong, in Europe, in America, and even in Asia, uh, another name they're familiar most is the Pearl River Delta. I can tell you that basically you see the same uh, of the two names as the same places. How to describe these places? It is a, a place next door to Hong Kong as well as Macau, but uh, it's being given a lot of new films in terms of innovation, in terms of uh, uh, a convenient and high standard living uh, uh, standard uh, among the uh, Chinese mainland. But one particular theme is that it is going to be the window of the, uh, to the world for China. Why do I say that? If you look at this region, overall the size is about one sixth of Germany, but with a population slightly bigger than Germany already. Uh, forgive me to use German uh, as a reference because I hope that it's easier to put things into perspective. Uh, the income level of this region of 86 million is just about a third of what Germany enjoys or what most of Europe enjoys. Uh, so there's a lot of potential for this place to grow. And in fact, the last 40 years, this is, this is the region where China is the highest growth. China itself is one of the highest growth area in the world. And within China, this region of Pearl River Delta and Greater Bay Area now called is actually the highest of, of China itself. So for that, actually it tells us from <coughs> then the growth momentum being built is because of integration economic exchanges, globalization or regionalization in different aspects. What we are seeing here is that this region itself is going into another new phase of development with closer connection among all the cities in this region as well as between this region versus the rest of the world and rest of mainland. There are several uniqueness of this region. It's being one of the open or most open region in China is a region with the most international connections, both in terms of business as well as other social and other cultural connections. And it's actually more important is that, particularly for friends from Europe, it is the most market-driven economy or sector or region in the whole of China. And the reason for all this uniqueness is that it is the only place where you find a one country, two systems in uh, China. And <coughs> There are a lot of measures being introduced over the last two years since this uh, region is being designated as one of the major growth strategy or development strategy of China. To summarize is that there are a lot of measures being introduced to facilitate the connectivity between different places in terms of the people's flow, capital flow, goods flow, and service flow. I don't go into details, but for um, friends who are from outside of Hong Kong, just imagine that this place as a whole, which is 10 times the population of Hong Kong, will be given a lot of convenience for people who live here in Hong Kong will have the access, or same convenient access to the whole region uh, of 56,000 uh, kilometers, as convenient as you live in Hong Kong now, provided that the people flow, capital flow and goods flow, all those things come into uh, 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 implementation. Um, to put this region into a more wider perspective, how it compares with other places. Um, from here, we normally look at the San Francisco Bay Area, as well as the New York Metropolitan Area, Tokyo Bay Area. All these are clusters of uh, key cities or uh, developed areas where we, have, we see particular growth strength, either in terms of finance, in terms of technology, or in terms of industrial capability. To put it simply, this Greater Bay Area or Pearl River Delta Area has one of the most developed feasible infrastructure in terms of transport, in terms of logistics. It's well much bigger than all the other three regions to compare with. But it has one of the lowest uh, per capita uh, GDP, which means that the growth potential is still much higher. And over the years, 
the flow for momentum in this region is well higher than the others. So without further trends, I would like to highlight some key areas for business outside of uh, the region to go into GPA. Basically, there are several aspects. For those who are uh, keen on production, it is one of the most industrialized uh, region in China where you can find different kind of manufacturing facilities and investment opportunities. For those who are interested to tap on the market in China, not just the 1.4 billion or so, but immediately the 86 million population which are twice as wealthy as the average of China, which is a ready uh, consumer market to tap with. And also for people who are looking for different lifestyles, uh, either between Hong Kong, China, or the East or versus West, this is one of the reasons which we, you, you will experience some of the most uh, rapid development and improvements going forward. And lastly, it's about innovation. Uh, we've probably heard of uh, some the Silicon Valley of China, which is Shenzhen. Uh, but Greater Bay Area, including Shenzhen itself, has more than half of the China's patent granted or approved each year. In China, you know that now is the largest number, has the largest number of patent among all the countries around the world each year. So this is one of the places where you see a lot of ingredients for innovation and technology development. Lastly, a little bit about our uh, promotion is the, what we can have from TDC. Aside from inf information, a lot of different studies, we actually have six, uh, 19 outlets within the Greater Bay Area uh, to help companies who are interested to tap into the market to uh, uh, sell to di uh, different channels. And we are going to have different kind of promotion events later this year. And we have already done a lot uh, before the pandemic uh, in, in the region. And we actually have um, more than a million of different business contacts uh, within this region uh, to connect with. And for those who are interested in going further about how to make use of uh, HKTDC, I think our colleagues in Europe and around the world can help. So, um, but then I hope I can give you a very brief summary of what we see and how we are doing. And I hand it over to Victor. Thank you, Mr. Guan. Today, we are also very pleased to have Mr. Victor Zhu, Chairman and CEO, First Eastern Investment Group, a leading Hong Kong-based international investment firm and a pioneer of private equity investment in China, joining us. He will share on the topic, Hong Kong as a vibrant business and investment hub. Mr. Ji, please. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And I want to thank uh, Patrick and his colleague uh, for uh, organizing this uh, very exciting uh, webinar. And I want to congratulate Nick for uh, a very comprehensive and very attractive and really practical presentation of the GBA opportunity. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, of course, Hong Kong has gone through some very challenging time in the last two or three years. Of course, there are challenges uh, that we face, uh, whether they are social, structural, economic, and some geopolitical. And of course, um, for many of you who are good friends of Hong Kong, uh, you know that we have been the recipient of many negative um, uh, information, negative PR uh, over the last few months. And of course, um, Hong Kong being part of the uh, one country, two system, uh, system of government, we are also uh, swept into some global uh, uh, economic and geopolitical uh, debate and challenges. All these um, does not mean that Hong Kong can be written off. Hong Kong's uniqueness is very much intact. Hong Kong's resilience and competitiveness is really going from strength to strength. As an international firm based in Hong Kong, what are we looking for uh, for international investment hub? We're looking at innovation, uniqueness, differentiation, sustainability, and competitiveness. And in all these factors, Hong Kong scored extremely high. Now, as Nick has said in his presentation, the Greater Bay Area is one of the exciting developments um, that Hong Kong is now very much um, involved with uh, Guangdong government and the central government 
in putting that exciting plan into practice. We're still early days, but the potentials are tremendous. I will explain that a little bit later. Hong Kong, being an international financial hub, has done extremely well in the last few years, even in the last two or three years when we are subject to uh, huge, unprecedented challenges. Hong Kong Stock Exchange is the largest exchange company by way of um, uh, market cap. The Chinese stock market combined, which is Hong Kong, Shanghai, and Shenzhen, is over 10 trillion US. It accounts for over 10% of global um, equities market altogether. And Hong Kong, in the last eight out of 10 years, has the highest amount of IPO that comes through internationally. And in more recent years, uh, a lot of the IPO came from uh, biotech and new economy companies. Now that is a, another exciting development in Hong Kong. For the last 40, 50 years, Hong Kong has been a center par excellence for property development, infrastructure, logistics, and financial services. But in the last few years, with the evolution of our market, with the reforms in the stock exchange, with the growing connection with China, particularly with the Pearl River Delta, now the Greater Bay Area, some new opportunities has arisen. Now, synthetic biology is now the name of the game, particularly as we are going through COVID-19 and other infectious disease. Synthetic biology requires a cluster of expertise where you need clinical research, huge pharmaceutical companies manufacturing operation, you need a big market, and you need venture capital, a fundraising center. Now, Hong Kong itself does not have it all, but Hong Kong plus GBA has it all. And that really gives rise to new opportunities for those of us here, international companies as well as local, as well as our colleagues north of the border in GBA. So in synthetic biology, wellness, public health, these are new, innovative, exciting industries that is coming about. And other areas which traditionally we are not very well known of is digitization or what I will loosely call the fourth industrial revolution, the IT revolution, big data, AI, robotics. These are things which are probably more akin to Europe and maybe the Silicon Valley. But Hong Kong plus GBA will become, or if it's not already one, a leading center of innovation in all these sectors. Plus the stock market here, which is so vibrant, the private equity and the venture capitalists all center in Hong Kong and Shenzhen will make this development even faster and quicker. I want to share with you a number of new developments here which you may not be aware of. One is in terms of sustainability and sustainability finance, Hong Kong will definitely be a, a world leader. As you know, China has committed to uh, carbon net zero by uh, 2060, Hong Kong itself by 2050, that will create a huge amount of sustainable finance and green finance project and opportunity. Hong Kong government has already mandated the issue of up to 20 billion US dollars of green bond in the next five years. And the Hong Kong Stock Exchange is committed to accelerate and transform Hong Kong to be a leading center of sustainable finance. Just to give you some idea of the amount we're talking about. Globally, there are probably 30 trillion US dollars, which is committed to the broad sustainable uh, financing. But in Asia, less than 1% so far uh, is accounted for. So if Asia, and particularly East Asia, like what uh, Nick has alluded to, will lead the world in the post-COVID recovery, Hong Kong being the leading international financial center in Asia will take the lead in catching up. So sustainable finance, sustainable projects, 
ladies and gentlemen, particularly as COP26 is just around the corner in terms of climate, renewable energy will become extremely exciting here. My firm, which are big investors in renewable project and energy efficiency in Europe, in Japan, and in ASEAN, we are using Hong Kong as a springboard to international investment. But closer to home, we will do more in Hong Kong and GVA in the months ahead. Another area to talk about sustainability is that the International Financial Reporting Standards Foundation will be setting up a FSB, Sustainable Standards Board, which will create matrices for companies to report on their sustainable standards. They will start with climate, but eventually will go into other sectors and matrices, touching on the theme of sustainability. The World Economic Forum and IOSCO are amongst the first international organizations to endorse and support the setting up of this new initi initiative by IFRS. And eventually, I think this will go into international regulators' rule book in terms of their listing requirements. And Hong Kong, as a leader in ESG and sustainable aspects of uh, listing and fundraising, I have every uh, expectation that Hong Kong will be the fund runner, if not one of the front runners, front runners in this particular development. So again, my European friends, sustainability is very much in your DNA. I think Hong Kong speaks the same language and we resonate on the same value of sustainability. And finally, I want to touch on another new initiative from here. In Hong Kong, we have something called the growth portfolio of the Futures Fund. The Futures Fund is around 220 billion US dollars, and it is part of the Hong Kong uh, government's uh, land fund um, that we have developed uh, over uh, the last uh, 20, 30 years. But 22 billion, 10% of this uh, portfolio is being now hive out for venture capital and private equity investments to promote the Hong Kong nexus. We will invite international fund management companies to give proposals and we hope that we will generate a lot of interest. And when the first 10% is being allocated, we can draw on more based on the experience of the first batch. This will broaden the attraction of Hong Kong as an international private equity and alternative investment uh, center. And will also give Hong Kong listing, Hong Kong professionals, and Hong Kong nexus, as broadly defined, a lot more dry powder to play in a growingly competitive market. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, I want to say that the, the Wealth Connect program um, under the GBA is another very exciting uh, area. This will enable Hong Kong uh, residents to invest through a, a pilot system into Chinese investment products and Chinese investors to invest in products accredited by Hong Kong regulators. So basically, again, it's cross-fertilizing the vast pool of liquidity in Hong Kong and through Hong Kong from international investors into the, the fastest growing economy post-COVID in the world, which is China, but also allow Chinese savers with huge savings to broaden their investments through Hong Kong into international products. Again, this is part and parcel of Hong Kong's introducing Chinese companies onto our Hong Kong market in 1992, when we first started the X-Share program, and then more recently, the Hong Kong Shanghai Connect and Hong Kong Shenzhen Connect, the Bond Connect, and now the latest is the World Connect. Very exciting. That is Hong Kong's contribution to bring the Chinese market, the East and West, closer together. 
Hong Kong has always been a connector par excellence. It is now more than a connector. It is a facilitator. It is also playing a role which European companies who likes Hong Kong, speak the same language, understanding that our core values of openness, rule of law, freedom of movement, capital, and expression are all really intact. Of course, at the end of the day, as I mentioned very early on, we do have structural social problems in Hong Kong, like everywhere else, but we are committed now that peace and stability is back because we have the clarity of what can or cannot be done within the one country to system uh, a system of government with our uh, sovereignty uh, with the uh, People's Republic of China. We are back. We are resilient. We are confident and we look forward to developing Hong Kong together with our European friends with confidence with humility and with a lot of enthusiasm. So please come to visit us when the COVID-19 situation is more settled. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Ju, for your very insightful sharing. Next, we are pleased to have Mr. Anna Jen, Director, Hong Kong and Pearl River Delta from Johns Y and Sons China Limited to share on the topic, Hong Kong as a gateway to Greater Bay Area and Asia opportunities. Mr. Chen, please. Okay, um, good afternoon and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much, Hong Kong DDC, for inviting me here. And I'm delighted to speak in this forum. And thank you very much for Patrick and Hans for the opening, and Nicholas and Victor for the sharing about Hong Kong and GBA. Very useful sharing indeed. Uh, for my section today, I'm going to talk about Swai Group's experience in Hong Kong and GBA, and also my humble opinions about how to capture the opportunities ahead. So now let me start by introducing Swai Group, and I'm going to show you some slides. Swai Group is a multinational conglomerate with diverse portfolio. Uh, our main business in Hong Kong and Chinese mainland. We have around 87% of assets in China, our major business include property, aviation, food and beverage, and retail. We have been a long-term investor in China with over 150 years of history. Our first office was opened in Shanghai in 1866, and our office in Hong Kong was first opened in 1870s. Over the past century and a half, we have turned it, our SWI group from a small-scale trading and shipping company into now a reputable international conglomerate. Um, going through all the up and downs in Hong Kong and weathering all the challenges, uh, just to name a few, the Asian financial crisis, uh, SARS, uh, social unrest, and the most recent COVID-19 pandemic. The key to our success has been our long-term investment strategies and our ability to adapt to the rapidly changing business environment and evolve. Now let me share Swire's stories uh, in terms of our development in Hong Kong and also our expansion in China. As you know that Hong Kong is our headquarter and also our major market. Our long-term commitment to Hong Kong has actually given us a lot of opportunities to develop our business. At the same time, the close ties between Hong Kong and the mainland China has also given us a perfect platform for us to expand our business in the Chinese market, which is a much bigger and faster growing market. Hong Kong first. As I said earlier, that our first office in Hong Kong was opened in 1870. At that time, it was Qing Dynasty, and our main business was trading and shipping business. Only after World War II, we actually started to strengthen our overall business portfolio. In 1948, we bought Cathay Pacific Airways two years after it was, found, it was founded. And over the years, we have turned Cathay Pacific into one of the world's best air, international airlines. Um, it has been a challenging time for Cathay due to COVID-19, but we are confident of the long-term future of Cathay. And then in 1950, two years after we bought an airline, we opened an aircraft maintenance facilities in Hong Kong, which we named HACO. Hong Kong Aircraft Engineering Company. And then in 1965, we acquired the franchise to produce and market Coca-Cola 
in Hong Kong, and also we bought a bottling plant in Cory Bay, which is near our dockyard in Cory Bay. And then in 1972, Swipe Properties was established, and then we turned our Cory Bay dockyard into a large-scale residential project, Tai Ku Sheng, which is still very popular uh, to this day. And in 1982, we opened City Plaza. It was a new concept at the time to the city, a large upscale mixed-use commercial complex. It also set a blueprint for us to build our flagship property project, Pacific Place, in Admiralty, which is now one of the most popular premium shopping mall and a grade A office building. Um, while we are developing our business in Hong Kong from the 1950s to 1970s, as you may know that China was undergoing a turbulent time until the late 1970s when they started opening up and reform. At that juncture, not many foreign investors could predict the future success of China. Swire, however, was one of a small handful of multinational conglomerate choose to re-enter into the Chinese mainland market, signaling a vote of confidence of what we would believe a period of extraordinary growth. Swire Group, over the years, over the four, last 40 years, we witnessed the China's remarkable achievement in terms of both social and uh, economic development. We have contributed to and benefited from the China's success. Um, we based on our experience and expertise we accumulated in Hong Kong and applied the best practices in our investment in Chinese mainland. In 1979, uh, we produced the sh first shipment of bottle Coca Cola to the Chinese mainland market. And then in 1989, uh, we opened our own production facilities in Nanjing, Hangzhou, and Guangzhou. And up to now, uh, Swai Coca Cola has 18 bottling plants in 11 provinces plus Shanghai, employing 23,000 staff, and we're serving a franchise population of 675 million. And in 1981, due to the rapid development of the tourism and also aviation in the Chinese mainland, Cathay Pacific started operating flights between Hong Kong and the Chinese mainland. Up to now, Cathay Pacific um, made one of the biggest market is the Chinese mainland market, and we connect China with the rest of the world. And in 1993, our aircraft uh, engineering company, uh, Heiko, also invested in China. Uh, we, we actually opened uh, aircraft maintenance facilities in Xiamen Airport, thanks to the support from the Xiamen government. And now, Heiko Xiamen is one of the best MRO, maintenance, repair, and overall service providers in the world. So our properties, uh, we opened our first representative office in 2001, and now we have five completed projects all over China in Guangzhou, Shanghai, Beijing, and Chengdu. All of them are the mixed-use retail-led model we adopted in Hong Kong, the successful model we adopted in Hong Kong. While each of them was uniquely designed to blend into their home city, and most importantly, add value to the local community. Swipe so properties over the years achieved very good growth in terms of our properties and retail business in mainland China, thanks to the growing demand for the quality um, uh, retail and working space brought by the robust economic growth in China. So you can see that Swipe Group could manage to capture and capitalize the opportunity arise from the opening up and reform of China in the last 40 years, and we have also played our part. Now, moving forward, we believe the next opportunity of growth will be GBA. GBA is a national initiative to integrate Hong Kong and Macau with the nine neighboring cities in Guangdong province. And our confidence is built upon four key elements, scale, demographic, infrastructure, and policy which have been touched on by different speakers in the past and also by our speakers today too. So in short, for me just in short to talk about this, is GBA is a region with 70 million population, 10 times that of Hong Kong, and even bigger than UK. GDP is 1.7 trillion US dollar, ranks even higher than South Korea and Australia. But the GDP per capita in Guangdong province is only one third of Hong Kong, with a growing middle class 
and at the same time younger population. So there is a huge potential for growth. At the same time, the transport infrastructure that crisscrosses the region together with a supportive policy from not just the local government, but also from the central government has actually turned this region into a very attractive region for foreign investor to invest. So GBA is a particular focus for Swai Group's investment in the future. Let me quote a few of our business plans which are already in the pipeline. Properties um, with the growing middle class and the increasing spending powers, the demand for high quality lifestyle, living, food and beverage, working space, entertainment are increasing. And our Taiku Hui, which is located in Guangzhou, is already an iconic landmark in the Tanhe CBD. It comprises hotel, shopping mall, and also working space. Now, we are also working, looking for more opportunities to expand our property projects in the region, including residential projects, uh, commercial and retail projects, in order to meet the increasing demands. And for aviation, GBA is positioned as an international innovation and technology hub. Together with Hong Kong's role as an international financial center, actually there's a lot of demand for the international travel. The infrastructures, which has significantly improved the connectivity between cities in GBA, and at the same time, uh, shorten the, uh, the time to access to the five major airports in the GBA, which include the Hong Kong International Airport, which connect 200 destinations worldwide. For example, um, Hong Kong Zhuhai Macau Bridge, which is a 40 kilometer bridge linking the western part of the periphery, Zhuhai and Macau, with the eastern part of the periphery, Hong Kong. As a result of the bridge, it significantly reduces the, the traveling time from GBA into Hong Kong, especially from these three, from the cities Zhuhai, Macau, and even Zhongshan, and encourage the people from GBA to come to Hong Kong and come to Hong Kong International Airport and fly overseas. So our airlines, Cathay Pacific Airways, is actually working closely with different transport companies, um, ferry services, uh, bus services, limousine, helicopter, and also high-speed rail link, in order to provide faster, easier, and more convenient access to Hong Kong International Airport. Now, Swai Group is also looking for opportunities to invest in new sectors which have good potential for growth. We have recently invested in New Frontier Hospital in Shenzhen, which is a comprehensive multi-specialty hospital which provides 350 inpatient beds um, covering 64,000 square meter floor areas. And we believe healthcare is a sector with good potential growth. With the growing uh, middle class, and also the aging population in China, we believe the demand for private, high quality healthcare services will be increasing. So all in all, the recent COVID-19 pandemic does pose challenges you know, to different business sectors. And we remain confident about the future of Hong Kong and GBA. GBA will be, will be the future growth engine. And we look forward to better flow of people and goods uh, uh, through better policies and infrastructures. That would definitely benefit our business in Hong Kong and also our expansion in Guangdong province. Swai so Group will stick to our long-standing, long-term investment strategies and continue to invest in Hong Kong. And we will ride on the distinctive advantage of Hong Kong to expand our home market from Hong Kong to GBA. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Zhang, for your sharing. Now, let's move on to the panel discussion. Joining now distinguished the panel of speakers is also Mr. Silas Yu, Regional Director, Europe, Central Asia and Israel, HKTVC, who is the moderator of this session. There will be a Q&A session following the panel discussion. Please feel free to submit your questions via the Q&A box on Zoom, and our speakers will try to answer your questions afterwards. Now, without further ado, Silas, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tammy. Welcome to the panel discussion and the Q&A session. I'm impressed with the overwhelming turnout today, which speaks for itself about the immense interest in leveraging Hong Kong as a business hub for Asia. Um, so the question is very simple. There are now many options in China and with China government also launching other initiatives, the audience would like to know, would it still make sense 
to go wire Hong Kong or they should go direct. Um, anyone would like to go first? I, I previously mentioned about Victor. I hope uh, we have given you enough time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very Please, much Victor. indeed, uh, Silas. This is a very good question. Um, oh, now, of course, we will, um, we will say that um, uh, this is a, it, an easy question to, to, to answer. Of course, Hong Kong is the, is the easy choice. But I, I, I think it's, um, it is a more complicated question. Um, Hong Kong has, has always been the premier gateway um, to China um, because the, um, a lot of the international financing are packaged together here. Our, uh, if there were um, uh, uh, disputes and in business there are bound to be uh, disagreements, then resolution of international disputes are um, easily done in Hong Kong. We have a tremendous a track record of international arbitration and litigation. And, and Hong Kong um, uh, uh, arbitral awards and Hong Kong um, uh, court orders are now being able to be enforced uh, in China itself. So coming through Hong Kong, there are so much advantage. And of course, particularly with international investors, the common language in business in Hong Kong is English. Um, we understand each other. We speak the same language. We believe in the same, you know, cultural and social um, uh, 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 tradition. So the ease of operate in and through Hong Kong, of course, um, is, is the is makes Hong Kong quite quite unique. But there are occasions where obviously one can go uh, direct in China. Uh, for example, trading um, now through the uh, e-commerce um, uh, is much easier done uh, through uh, uh, Taobao, right? In, in particularly if, if it is the uh, SMEs of the world. So I think that will also um, encourage and force Hong Kong to be at the cutting edge of innovation. We can't always expect that our traditional competitive advantage will always prevail. We have to continue to add competitive advantage so that we are more efficient, more value added, and always ahead of the curve. So I, I think, uh, Silas, I, I, I think we, we have to be um, uh, competitive and we have to be innovative and always ahead of the game. Yeah, thank you, Victor. I think among the many advantages of Hong Kong, risk management is certainly one very critical. And as part of the New York Convention, Hong Kong arbitration awards can be recognized and enforced in over 170 jurisdictions around the world. Thank you, Victor, for that. I see a hand raising up from, from, from Nick. Yeah, yeah. please, Nick. Uh, sorry, uh, I have to congratulate you <laughs> that you are a very high power uh, moderator. Uh, your power is so high that all the interrupt, uh, <laughs> intellect uh, uh, has been disrupted. But um, your question reminds me something I was asked actually a few years back in North America. People asked the same question, why should I or should I have to go to Hong Kong? And I asked my, uh, the question of my, uh, in, uh, the other way is that you seem to ask me that is it necessary to go to Toronto to do business with uh, Canada? or to put it in, uh, back in Europe, uh, is it necessary to go to Paris uh, for people who do want to do business with France? Um, of course, you can go direct. In fact, in a lot of cases now, with China opening so widely, I, would, I won't re recommend those who are interested in the law of this to come here first, unless you see something that we can help you or you can benefit from being here. As uh, Victor just mentioned that the language the connections, the legal environment, the free flow of information, all those things. Most of those are granted by the un under the one country, two system that makes Hong Kong different from other parts of China. If you see value from this, then you probably don't have too much choice. You, know, uh, you have to come here. Um, my take is that these things are all dynamics. Uh, people see that China has been opening more and more these days, with Hainan being given the status as a free trade port. Uh, more than 20 free trade zones are set up in different provinces around China with all kinds of 
uh, special policies and more liberal uh, operating environment. All this combined has yet to match with what you can get from here in Hong Kong. So that's why I say that there's a long time before you can see things which are distinctly uh, different from what you can get in the other part of China versus what you can get from Hong Kong in terms of convenience for business. It is a place where you get through national treatment, uh, which is hard to uh, think of in other, many other places. So my answer is simple, it depends. But you will miss a lot if you, think, if you don't think about Hong Kong before you jump. Also okay, thank you. Uh, Arno, I think uh, there should not be any argument for this question for your company's <laughs> why it has been uh, in legendary success uh, making use of Hong Kong. May thank I have you, your comment? Thank you, thank you Salas. Um, yes, definitely. I think we, uh, as a UK company, we believe strongly that Hong Kong is the perfect platform for us you know, to use it to invest in Hong Kong at the same time to expand our business in the Chinese mainland. Well, um, I think Nicholas and Victor also named a few, um, the rule of law, independent judiciary, low tax region, language, diverse talent pool, all these things has already well proven that Hong Kong is an attractive uh, city for foreign investor to invest. Just like us, um, I think we can all consider, instead of just go direct to any other cities, I think Hong Kong is still a very good place for setting up your headquarter. At the same time, and make use of your Hong Kong company to radiate your investment throughout the whole mainland China. Just like what we do, uh, we have our headquarters in Hong Kong, listed in Hong Kong, but at the same time, we also have office in Shanghai, Beijing, Chengdu, everywhere in the mainland China. Um, but at the same time, uh, because of all the facility, all the policies that can facilitate um, uh, the Hong Kong companies to invest in the mainland China, take for example, the SIPA, Stock Connect, um, uh, Bond Connect, all these things can actually encourage you know, all the Hong Kong companies and also all the foreign company set up headquarters in Hong Kong to actually invest in different cities in the Chinese mainland. Thank you, Rano. I think there is a follow-up question. Um, there is a question about can speakers elaborate a little bit more on the cooperation economically between the Chinese and the Hong Kong government to integrate the GBA as one of the future business hubs in the world. I think uh, Nick mentioned previously that geographically, the GBA is uh, virtually the same as the Pearl River Delta region. So how is it different this time? I think the government policy, the central government support is, is a crucial part here. Maybe this question may I ask uh, Nick to give some response first? Uh, thank you. Uh, put it very simply, Pearl River Delta is a concept that comes naturally from the market, that people identify these places through the river itself. But in the old days, when we talk about Pearl River Delta, particularly those from here in Hong Kong or outside of China, their thinking is that this delta doesn't include Hong Kong and Macau. Uh, because in most cases, it's referred to the mainland part of it. Now with the GBA, basically it's very clearly defined that all 11 cities, including Hong Kong and Macau, are part of it. So to that extent, that makes some marginal difference. But you're right that uh, the whole thing is, um, uh, the key differences now is that this region has been integrating from bottom up and then gradually from top down also uh, for more than four decades. But it has come to a point where more coordination among the different neighborhoods government from the uh, city here in Hong Kong to the province in China, in Guangdong, as well as the different level of cities. They have come to a point that this kind of coordination have to go beyond the region itself, including the central government. At one time, there's a, a greater plan of a, a pan Pearl River Delta, including 11 provinces around these spaces. Yet, experience is that it's very difficult to coordinate. Each one have their own agenda behind, which is natural. Same in the EU, I guess. But uh, China is a place where um, government used to be run in a very centralized way. And they see that with the policy uh, differences, with the uh, system differences, with the different standards and all these things, it would take quite a while to coordinate. And finally, 
it's a time for the central government to help to put things together. So that's why when you see all the programs we come up with uh, since the uh, Greater Bay Area, a lot of those actually require the coordination from the central government. For instance, the Wealth Connect, which has come out. Uh, you can't imagine the 11 cities or even the Guangdong province to talk to Hong Kong and Macau and come up with a scheme which affect the financial system of whole China. How to differentiate that be between the region versus those outside the region? It is something we need more than the local uh, governments to coordinate. Uh, second, further, uh, we're talking about airport coordination. There are four major airports within the region, uh, three major ports among the top 10 of the world in this region. They all need more coordinated operations. Something more than just a uh, traffic light, which go where, uh, by what time. But how to um, arbitrage, address, complement each other in terms of policy, in terms of long-term development. Uh, so all these actually need something much higher up from, uh, from the top. But on the other hand, it doesn't mean that we can uh, forget about the grassroots and bottom-up initiative. In fact, what we are missing now is that we need the ground, uh, the ground, the uh, the bottom-up approach. That different sectors, industries, will have to come up with their own suggestions, proposals to make the whole thing work. So we are trying, as uh, particularly from the TDC's perspective, we work closely with the market, and we particularly interested in not just bringing, making the local people within the 11 cities to work together, but also bring in the international community, our friends from Europe, who see the opportunities here. How can we facilitate them to benefit from this integration of the region? So all this actually has come to a point that we need something better coordinated from the top and the central versus just uh, also the local government. Well, uh, Frika, what do you think? I have uh, something extra for, for, you, for both of you, for both uh, Arnold and you. Um, there is also a follow-up question. They would like to know what business sector do you think will be able to whip the most benefit out of the GBA? Yeah, I think- Yeah, Frika, would you like to go? The GBA is a cluster of expertise, skills, and synergy. And I, I think the is really win-win uh, for both Hong Kong and, and our, our partners in, in GBA. So in terms, I, I mentioned about uh, biotech, uh, the synthetic uh, uh, biology, which European uh, friends are, are very advanced. I, I, I mentioned a little bit about logistics. I mentioned about digitization, you know, robotic manufacturing, AI, big data. These are, you know, and smart uh, cities urban mobility, um, uh, urban uh, aviation mobility, um, you know, drones, driverless cars, um, things that provide and enhance wellness uh, for the elderly. Um, for, uh, these are, you know, uh, opportunities which Hong Kong does not have the resource to do it alone. You know, we don't have the, the land uh, to do it and we don't have the manufacturing uh, uh, resource capability and the supply chain uh, to do it alone. But with GBA, um, that will make it um, interesting. And GBA with Hong Kong means that it's open to international uh, collaboration. Um, uh, our European friends coming to Hong Kong and through their Hong Kong companies going into GBA um, will, will be most welcome. And I think that's why um, it is synergy, differentiation, adds competition, and therefore um, it creates opportunities, not just for China, Guangdong, Hong Kong, but also to international investors, particularly European investors. Yep, I know. Yes, um, I think for, well, GBA actually, like Shenzhen, the average age is 32 years old. And, um, and also the GDP ca per capita um, I think the government just announced that they want to double the GDP per capita by 2035. So there are a lot of potential for growth in different sectors. And I would not rule out any sector with, you know, with great potential. Uh, in fact, I think as investors, we should focus on our core strengths. 
and then look at you know what kind of industries that you can invest and compete in such a fast growing market. So for, for us, as I mentioned, that we uh, first of all we'll expand our existing existing business like aviation properties. At the same time, we have just invested in a uh, in hospital on a healthcare business because we think that healthcare is also talking about quality, uh, reputation, operation excellence. These are things that we, we believe is our core strengths. That's why we invest in a new sector. So my suggestion to all the potential investors in GBA is, first of all, understand your core strengths and everything is possible in GBA. And come to GBA, come to Shenzhen, come to Guangzhou, to understand more about the local cultures and look for more opportunities. Everything is possible in GBA, I believe. Thank you, Arnold. I think seeing is believing. And uh, the DC, we organize a lot of uh, outbound missions uh, for market study in, in the GBA areas. Um, especially the Federation also have a side trip every year. Um, so you are welcome to inquire our local offices for more details. So there's a question uh, raised by many of our audience that would like to have your views on the outlook of the EU-China relations. How will it affect the role of Hong Kong as a business hub between Europe and China? And in, in fact, it is a very good question. The raising geopolitical tensions has received a lot of uh, attention lately. So should companies be concerned? Any, anyone would like to answer this question? If yes, don't Nick. Mind. Yep. Um, sometimes it's difficult to understand why the current situation of sort of confrontation between the two places for, in fact, um, for me, it all, all sounds like a fairy tale that there's a saying around over two years ago uh, that over the years of China's opening, uh, it seems that China is gaming on the existing system by benefiting from this globalization process without offering something equivalent and changing itself to uh, the local light of the other uh, players in the system. For those who uh, didn't come to Asia often, this may be something uh, believable. But for anyone who live in Asia and come, uh, go to China often enough, especially over the last 40 years, the change you have seen in China is unfor uh, unprecedented. And for people in Hong Kong who can tell you that a lot of people who go for doing business in China, uh, the change we see in China over the last 40 years a lot of those actually coming from Hong Kong, originating from Hong Kong. The way they employ people, the way they uh, do business contract. Um, now that they are the largest uh, traders of the world, largest uh, manufacturer of the world, and most of those actually start from here, from the periphery Delta, from the Greater Bay Area. So my thinking is that actually, you never seen a place with so much change and move so close to the rest of the world in such a short period. And yet, people are saying that, uh, some people are saying that they're not doing the same thing. They're not doing something else. For me, actually, the Chinese economy has one of the most complementary uh, element with the EU in particular. EU is a, um, a lot of countries getting together, integrating, and uh, through the process, been growing by itself. China also is a well-integrated uh, system, but it's trying to diversify and open up for the last 40 years and manage to grow also. Both actually benefit from the globalization process we have seen in the last 40 years. And there are many more we can do to work together. And Hong Kong is where uh, is the, uh, the best place to get those two together. All this hasn't changed, hang on, honestly, until this new theory of about China's development is uh, coming. And surprisingly, uh, a lot of people seem to believe that. But for those who, uh, you talk to people in Hong Kong, in Asia, uh, and those who uh, visit China often enough, uh, they can tell you that there's a lot of question mark behind this argument. But uh, to answer your question simply, I said that uh, definitely we still the key hub to connect the East and the West, particularly EU and China. 
can see a lot, we see a lot of complementarity uh, between these two great economies, uh, both in terms of technology, in terms of even culture and all the other things. Uh, there's a lot of things we have to do and just simply talking about GBA itself, uh, the pioneer for change in China, uh, there's a lot we can learn from EU as well as the, there's a lot the EU can help us to develop here. Uh, the only change I can mention is that um, because the world has changed and people's been thinking, uh, deglobalization, unilateralism, all this coming uh, around the world, just like the pandemic which hit us so badly, we need to actually work closer and harder in different ways. And this is new, this new different phase is something we need to work together to find out what's the best way we can work together. Hong Kong is always ready to change and make things work better. Uh, we need our friends in Europe to work to, uh, with us together. And anyway, I don't see any major change in our role, but the way we work need to change and adapt to the overall uh, global environment. Yeah. Thank you, Nick. I have a few specific questions for individual speakers, but before I do so, um, is there anything um, Arno or Victor would like to, to respond? And if not, let me go to the individual questions. Victor, there's a, a question for you. You, are, you. you run a very successful and leading investment company. So as you know, the European market have become more regulated for the FDI with the screening framework regulation went into effect in 2019. So do you see any impact on the Chinese investment in EU over the next few years? What is the outlook and in views of all these development, are there any implications to Hong Kong's role as a conduit for Chinese outbound investment? Victor, please. Uh, that's a very good question. I think uh, all over the world, um, there is um, some uh, shifting of the sand in terms of um, cross-border uh, investment. And, and that's partly um, to deal with, um, you know, even before uh, COVID-19, um, glo globalization has achieved many benefits for humanity, but there's also some, um, you know, negative pitfalls that um, because the, the prosperity, the fruits of globalization has not been shared in or, 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 or perceived to be shared in an equitable way. So there is some decoupling in terms of uh, philosophy and, 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 and indeed in business. And there's also, um, uh, like for example, the, uh, when we talk about the PPEs, there is a uh, realization that um, quite sensibly that uh, one should not uh, uh, rely on one particular supply chain. It should be more uh, uh, diversified. Uh, so, for ch you know, China also feels that in terms of chip uh, uh, supply chain, it shouldn't be uh, just rely on one or two uh, supply sources. So that mentality is now coming into 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 the the, the, the mix. And then you have, um, you know, particularly during the Trump era, th this national security um, uh, equation. So. W willy-nilly, there will be a lot more scrutiny in certain sectors uh, in terms of M&A. But I think it is very important for, um, for us to have clarity. What sectors really falls within this national security review or anti-competitive uh, review? Mm -hmm. Or what are purely commercial um, deals that we should let the market um, a function uh, by itself. So that is a disruption that we need to live through and find uh, e equilibrium. Now, certainly um, uh, for us, we have not um, uh, so far found any uh, difficulty in our investments in renewable energy, um, in um, uh, aviation-related um, business, uh, logistics, and... and, and um, and financial services, we, we, we don't fall within that kind of, uh, uh, of situation. But once you get into high technology, uh, that may, um, you know, that we, we, we need to go through a slightly more complicated review process. And I think, as I, I might mention, we shouldn't be too politicized on this. We really need to have clarity so that everybody know what the rules are 
and when you know what the rules are, we can go through them um, with our professional advisors. Thank you. Uh, I know there's a question for you. Swire has a very diverse portfolio of business, including some of the uh, SM, uh, FMCG business. So in terms of marketing, is there any different uh, differences in the approach uh, or messages between the Chinese or, or, or the Hong Kong consumers? And in particular, work, what kind of things work in Hong Kong but not working in China? Well, um, China actually is a very big market. Um, imagine there are 34 provincial administrative regions. And in fact, each of these regions, they have their own different culture and also different local uh, policy and regulations. Uh, at the same time, the people there, you know, their, their, their preference, their habit, everything can be different. So our experience is uh, while we are uh, investing in the Chinese mainland market and together with Hong Kong, I think we have to treat every single city as a very different market. So that you know, whenever we invest in that city, we have to really understand, spend time to understand the local culture and also to uh, try to understand the government, understand the government policies. And for our experience, when we are expanding our business, uh, we sometimes we also look for local partners because with uh, local partners, we're working together. Uh, they have a better understanding about the, the local people, local culture, and local government. Um, so for us, I'm not an expert in FMCG, but as a group, uh, we believe that when you want to invest uh, and also you want to do the marketing, um, um, maybe something you work, it works in your own home city, not just Hong Kong, but in your home city. It may not work in, uh, uh, in some other cities in the Chinese mainland. It may work in Shanghai. Maybe it may not work in Beijing. So at the end of the day, I think uh, the way of marketing is to treat every single city differently and try to understand every city, uh, the culture, in order to market effectively. Thank you, Arnold. Very similar. The same is uh, here in, in Europe. EU is not just one single market. Um, Nick, quickly, uh, may I have your comment? Uh, the audience would like to know about uh, the ASEAN opportunities. You mentioned Hong Kong is also a business hub for ASEAN opportunities. Can you quickly comment on that? Um, yes. Um, if you look at the geographical uh, location here, um, Hong Kong has the benefit of being the major opening for the mainland to the rest of the world for quite a long, uh, 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 a long period of time. And much of those connections are actually start next door from ASEAN and Southeast Asia. Um, that's why you see actually a lot of so-called ASEAN companies, ASEAN-based companies actually end up to be a Hong Kong company these days, including from hotel to property and all those things. So that tells you the historical connections. Um, when China opened up, actually, this is a place where we see first a lot of Hong Kong people going into China. But to be honest, even though we have one of the highest per capita GDP, we don't have, now not everyone here is Li ka mm -hmm. And the amount of investment that China record from Hong Kong is well be beyond the capability of all the Hong Kong people to, together to invest. A lot of those things actually come through ASEAN and other, uh, many other uh, places. So we have been the hub for mainland versus uh, rest of the world. And immediately, uh, those companies and uh, uh, interests from ASEAN. Um, this is going to bring in a new life uh, because several development. One is that China has a free trade agreement with ASEAN for uh, the uh, version two already. So a lot of things are actually uh, tariff free. And Hong Kong also have our ASEAN free trade agreement, fully effective, uh, fully implemented, uh, which will facilitate our connections again. Uh, friends from Europe will also heard about ALCEPT, uh, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership that include uh, all the major East Asian economies, including China, but except Hong Kong. But Hong Kong is well on the line to get in uh, when they're ready. Uh, and even with the joining uh, officially, actually we see a lot of benefit. With the region getting closer to each other, particularly between the mainland and ASEAN and uh, other East Asian countries, we have been benefiting from all the uh, interactions. Uh, give you a very uh, simple number. 
China and ASEAN trade has been growing at 8% per year for the last 10, uh, 10 years or so. Uh, in the same time, some people su uh, suspect that we will lose out in this business because they can go direct. As some people just ask, if I can go direct, why, why bother use Hong Kong? Our trade between Hong Kong and ASEAN actually grow by 6%, not as high as those between China and ASEAN, but we actually benefit a lot more and accelerate from what we have before. So the more the region integrate, the better is for us as a hub in the region. Uh, I would not restrict ourselves to ASEAN, but I, uh, I highlight ASEAN because there are two interesting events happened last year. Last year is the first year when China become the largest trading partner of EU. And last year is the first year when ASEAN become the largest trading partner with China. Both have something interesting, not just because both involve China, but just both tells you that the economic gravity has been tilting more and more to the east, where globalization grows faster and become and more, uh, more welcome. While those who are against globalization may lose out if they don't catch up, then we are lucky enough to be in that center of the hub, and we would like to drive for that for more. Hopefully, I answer your question. Well, I'm sure for a lot of the European companies, they share the same optimism um, that uh, China will be very important for the export-led recovery in the uh, post-COVID era. Um, time is running out before I close. I have one last challenge for all of you. In three sentences, if there is one thing you would like the audience to take away today, what would that be? Anyone would like to take the challenge first? Take home, uh, take home message for today. Please, Victor. I would like to say to my European friends, um, particularly those who have not um, visited Hong Kong uh, recently, that we are resilient. Um, COVID-19 has managed extremely well. Um, a lot of the negative uh, uh, comments you may see in the media um, may not be um, wholly objective. And the fact speed itself, I mean, Nick's presentation and Arno's presentation and the figures you'll be able to find in our trade figures and our recovery speak to a very competitive, resilient, sustainable Hong Kong with the initiative of GBA and other uh, programs. We are looking ahead uh, with our recovery with confidence. So we welcome our European friends to come and visit us and hopefully we'll be able to welcome you personally before too long. Yeah, uh, Who's I next? Think, I think uh, I echo what Victor said. Um, I think the pandemic actually posed challenges to us and I look forward to the border can be reopened as soon as possible so that we can all welcome all of you from different parts of the world to come to Hong Kong to really see a safer, stabler, and also uh, a GBA part of Hong Kong uh, for every one of you. So welcome. And particularly fly Cathay Pacific. Yes, and please. <laughs> 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 um, Nick. Three sentences. One is that the COVID tell us that the world is highly divided. But the COVID also tell us that we need to work closer to each, uh, with each other to overcome these challenges. And the first thing is that Hong Kong is ready and has to work together with you because we live on being open and being international and being market driven. So all our friends in Europe, uh, you're welcome to come as well as to help us. So thank you all the speakers again and uh, also to everyone joining us today. We really appreciate your interest in today's webinar. 